I um, just, I, I just want to see everyone's face. That way I know if you're sleeping or not. Um, I know some of you guys are excited about the Bears game today. All right. But I got to let you know, B.J. Bello, our own B.J. Bello is playing for the Eagles. He's playing for the Eagles. So forget all you Bears fans. Get out of here, Bears fans. Put that on the tape. I, I, I love how God is his providence. He got cut from the Browns, and then the Eagles picked him up, and now he's playing in a playoff game. Look at God. Thank God. Hallelujah. Man, well, I don't have much time. I meant give me a clock. I didn't mean for everyone to know how much time I have. Are you serious right now? All right, well, everyone stand up. Keep it going. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Can we get that clock on the front, too? So I can see it? That's fine. All right. Why well, don't, you know what? We don't have time for you to open your Bibles. I'm just going to have to go in. We're reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. Some of you all might know this verse. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as loss, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you've given us the gift of time. This life is a beautiful gift. Sometimes it's filled with pain and sometimes it's filled with laughter. But God, you've created all of these seasons and you've given us time. And we turn to you because you are outside of time. You see all of time equally vividly, God, and yet you operate within this world you've created. So, Lord, teach us today how to number our days. In Jesus' name, amen. You all can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I love having a clock up there because I came here to let you know you don't have much time. You don't look at your neighbor and say you don't have much time. Look at someone who's older than you and say, you really don't have. You really. <laughs> Look, the Greek language denotes two distinct principles when they talk about time. Kronos and Kairos. Kronos and Kairos. Most of us know Kronos because we think of chronological time. You look at your watch. We're all watching this Kronos, this, this time that is going down, that is slowly going down. But when you talk about Kairos time, that would be a right or an opportune moment. When they refer to Kairos time, they're talking to a moment where God begins to intervene in our world. In other words, chronos is quantitative. It's a number that you can kind of go with. And kairos really refers not to the quantity of time, but to the quality of time. How is the time? See, I don't want 2019. We're all, God willing, we all make it to 2020. But when I look back over 2019, I don't want to say that was a great chronological year. That was a great year, time-wise. I just went through the time. I want to look back on that and say, looking at the quality of 2019, it was a Kairos year. God intervened in my life during 2019. Maybe I'm the only one that feels that way. Am I? See, I want to look back over 2019 and say God is the only person that could have done that. 
the quality of this year I want to be God's doing. See, in the Judeo-Christian concept based on the Bible, time was always linear. It was a, an act of God. God created time, and, and, and it was an, time is something that God has created. And in the Christian worldview, we all feel that time at some point will end. We will not be with God wondering how much time we have left with him. Oh no, Lord, I might die in heaven. No, we, it's eternity. We can't even fathom it. We won't wonder how much time we have left because time will cease to be when we meet him. God, however, is uncreated and he is eternal and he exists outside of the observable universe that we all live in. And he decided to create this thing called time. And so we begin to contrast the created with the uncreated. How does something that is uncreated, God, outside of time, interact with this thing that he has created? See, there's only one being that does not experience time, who never has. For example, God does not know the future. What? He doesn't know the future. He is the future. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's already there. Oh, okay. Okay. You all didn't, uh, it's the new year. I forgot y'all got to wake. It's noon. You should be right there. What would it like to be, what would it be like to be uncreated, to never experience this thing called time? Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? Are you surprised that God is never surprised? See, time is the inexplicable raw material of everything. With it, everything is possible in our world, and without it, nothing. And the supply of time for each of us is a flat-out daily miracle. It should be astonishing when you wake up and examine it, because when you wake up each day, your purse is magically filled with another 24 hours. It is the most precious of the possessions that we have. Not our money, not our houses, not our cars. Our time is the most valuable possession. And no one can take it from it. No one can steal my time. And none of you guys get more time than me or less time than me. We all, we cannot draw on our future time. We cannot get into debt with time. All you can do is waste the passing moment. You cannot waste tomorrow, it's kept for you. You can't waste the next hour, it's kept for you. You have to live in these 24 hours of day and in those 24 hours you have to spend your health and pleasure and money and contentment and respect and the evolution of your immortal soul. It's right use, it's most effective use. It's a matter of the highest urgency and the most thrilling actuality and it all depends on time. Your happiness depends on what you do with your time. See, it's a daily miracle. Because when you pass on, you no longer have the gift of time. You move into the realm of eternity. I love it how the old saints used to say, I thank God that he woke me up this morning. We should all be ecstatic to be here. We should all wake up and be like, oh, hallelujah, oh, he did it, hmm, he did it again. Because every day that you wake up and you open your eyes, and, it's a gift. It's a gift. I think that's what Ashley taught us, isn't it? 24 years old. Time. As a matter of fact, all of us place great faith and great trust in God whenever we go to sleep. Can I get an amen? amen. Because you believe when you lay your head down that you're going to wake up the next day until you don't. So every day you have to make the most of the gift because everything we do, everything we learn, every moment happens within time. And we learn things in time, don't we? we base, I base my daughter's growing capacity by her age. Because at a certain age, you should, be, you should know how to use the restroom at a certain age. You should know how to make eggs. You should know how to cook a hot dog at a certain... See, 
That's why when you have a kid like, uh, I was thinking of uh, Shelly and Phil. I don't know if they're even here. I saw, I saw one of them. But Aiden, he's like four, maybe five now, and he's just such a big kid. And, and when you see a kid that's so big, you expect more out of them because over time we expect kids to grow and they mature. And, and so we expect more out of people if they look like they're, they've been living longer. They've spent more of this time than other kids. And you can build good habits or bad habits over time. You could take the next month, literally this next month, and establish a really good eating habit and look like Joanna at the end of the month. It has just got to work on it. You can establish a good exercise habit. All you got to do is just walk or go do. You could establish a new spiritual habit that you've never had. Just today, when I wake up today, I'm just going to pray for one minute. God, Lord, today, take over. Just see what happens. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can start a new parenting habit. We're going to read a book. We're going to do devotions with our kids. Or you can start saving a habit, a habit of saving money. I'm going to save 10% and put it away for a rainy day. You can start becoming a better friend over time. You don't need deliverance today. You need to prioritize your time. You change over time. And if a tough diagnosis comes, what do you say? How much time do I have left? Because we die over time. And that's the realm that all of us live in hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second, moment by moment. We're all in this thing called time. I think this poem sums it up. When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full grown man, time ran. And later as I older grew, time flew. Soon I shall find while traveling on, time gone. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You want wisdom? Then you have to realize the clock is ticking. See, some of us like to believe that we're at the beginning of the sermon where I had 35 minutes, but all of a sudden we're halfway through. It's easy to believe that you're at the beginning of the time. See, if you had a bank that credited your account each morning with $86,000 that carried over with no balance from day to day and allowed you to keep no cash in your account and every evening cancel whatever part of the amount you failed to use during that day, what would you do? You would spend it on our new church building. Hallelujah. You would take every single penny out of that account every single day. I don't care if you just, you, some of you all would just go buy grass. You would just buy a lawn. Stuff. You would just buy whatever. If you had to spend it, you would buy just nonsense. But listen, church, every morning you are credited with 86,400 second. And every night it's lost. Whatever you did not invest, it lost. It carries over no balances. You can't overdraft. Each day it's a new account that's opened. See, and if you fail to use it, the loss is yours. Psalm 39 gives us a little bit of perspective in David's complaint to God. He said, you have made my days as hand breasts and my age is as nothing before you. In other words, he meant to an eternal God, our time on earth is so brief. It's so brief. It's a blink of an eye. And, and, and you already know how this sermon ends, don't you? What are you doing with your time? That's how it ends. I just got a preview. That's how it ends. I need to preach more. I need to evangelize more. I need to give more. I need to fast more. I pray more. I need to do these things. Because that's what we think about time. Like, I'm going to figure it out, and I'm going to give you the best scenario of who I could be with my time. And it's going to be real spiritual and flighty and something that you'll never live up to. I'm going to fast every day. No, what? No, you're not. Look at someone and say, not you. I'm going to work out every day. Not you. Not you. Because sometimes when we think about time, all we can think about is ourselves. And we forget, church, that who's the main character of the Bible? Mm, and one more time. Who's the main character of the Bible? Thank you. So it would benefit us to ask ourselves a question, 
what did Jesus do with his time? What did he do with his moments? You ready? Get ready because this is so powerful because God incarnate clothed himself with humanity and walked through time. 33 years of it. What did he do with his time? You all ready for the first deep, very deep point? Very deep point, gonna change your lives. You're gonna write this down, put it on your kitchen wall, put it on your table, tell it to your kids at night. You all ready for the first point that Jesus did? I don't have much time, so please agree with me. Yes, we're ready, okay. Number one, he worked a normal job. I don't know if that was in the notes or not. He worked a normal job. What? We don't have a history of the life of Jesus apart from him being the temple in the temple as a very young boy. We don't have much of his younger life, but we do know that his father was a man named Joseph. And the Gospels describe Joseph as a, a, a tecton, which traditionally the word would be a person that's a carpenter or someone who works with his hands with woods and metals. And, and it, it, it's somewhat unspecific, but that's the idea. He, his father was at least an artisan in wood in general. And very little other information is given in the Gospels. They don't talk about it. And what's interesting about our Savior, God himself, is that he worked in obscurity for 18 years as a carpenter. That's crazy to me. Why would this matter in a discussion of time? Because God enters humanity and takes on the role of day labor, probably, probably from the time he was young until the time he had come on to take his public ministry. And, and some scholars believe that Joseph, his father, died at a pretty young age. That's why when he was on the cross, he looks at John, hey man, can you take care of my mama? Because the father was gone. So Jesus might have taken over the family business for many years in obscurity. Not only did God enter into humanity, but he redeemed our work. He made it valuable. So the next time you are on your job, daydreaming about doing something for God, look at someone and say, you're already being like Jesus. He has fashioned you and given you certain experiences to shape you into what he wants you to be. Keep on evangelizing on your job. Keep serving God. Keep walking like Jesus. Because when you wake up at 5 in the morning and you go and take the train downtown and you're grinding down there, look, you're being like Jesus. And here's the next thing. If you don't like your job, you can change your job. Well, I'm too old, pastor. I'm too young. I don't have experience. I have too much experience. Who told you that you can't change? Because you can do whatever you want with your time. You don't have to stay in the same old busted situation. Talk to people. Network with people. Do something with your time. Oh, I'm preaching good. Y'all not talking to me yet. This is going to help someone. Someone just type, type in their job right now. Uh, you ain't going to see me tomorrow. I didn't say that. Like wisdom. Let's use some wisdom. You can use your time to invest in your future. Look, people can be compared to a variety of birds. First, there's the canary. The canary is found singing up a storm. They sing all day. And other folks feed them, and they're pretty much powerless birds. And the canary is just singing and singing, and please feed me. And there's a lot of people that are just satisfied with the status quo. They're happy just to get their house and their car and their TV remote, and they sit down, and they are just fine singing along someone help me along and then you got the buzzard and the buzzard sits on poles all day and squawks and squats and squats makes this ir irritating sound and far too many people want to sit on the sidelines and just complain about their lives my wife is not this my husband's not that my job is like this i wish it was like that that's the buzzard the person who just sits around complaining all day and take never take ownership of the time that they've been given then you've got the peacock and the peacock just wants to sit up and look good all the time because their interest is only in themselves and they're strutting around and putting on a show and they don't have much substance but then once in a while you'll see an eagle and an eagle they don't sit around but they decide to soar and take their life wherever they're in complete control which bird might you be the savior <laughs> I'm a peacock now what
You can do whatever you want with your time. See, Jesus worked, and I love the idea that he followed in his father's, his natural father's footsteps, and then he also followed in his heavenly father's footsteps. Not my will, but your will be done. So look at someone and say, get a job. <laughs> Second thing Jesus did with his time. How much time do I have left? Okay. I might have to cut some of these points. He loved his heavenly father, second point, and he spent much of his time with him. Prayer, as we all know, was a vital, important part of the life of Jesus. And, and many times in the, in the New Testament, we see Jesus going off alone and praying. He prayed because he had a relationship with his daddy. See, for, for Jesus, loving his father isn't some duty that he does. You know, um, it's a relationship built on the reality of who God is. If Jesus had an important meeting, you know what he did? He said, let me go holler at my father real quick. If he was picking disciples, he would say, you know what, guys? I got to go up on a mountaintop and holler at my dad. When he was tired from ministry all day, most of us, when we're tired, what do we do? I'm just going to sit back and relax and kick my feet up. Jesus, when he was overwhelmed with a life and tired from ministry and everything else, you know what he did? He said, I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm exhausted. He said, I'm going to take some time and talk to my daddy. See, a little boy went grocery store shopping with his mom. And they were in the checkout line, and the grocer asked the mother if he could offer her son some candy. And the mother agreed, and then the grocer held out the gar, jar, encouraging the boy to reach in. And the boy said, I don't want any. The man stretched the jar out a little further and told the boy he could take as much candy as he would like. And the boy said, no, 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 no. And with the confused look, the grocer gave one last effort. He said, take some candy. And the boy finally said, I want you to give it to me. And the grocer took some candy out of the container, handed it to the boy who quickly offered his thanks. And we, when him and his mom got into the car on their way home, she said, why, why didn't you take the candy? Why did you tell him to give you the candy? And her son replied, because, Mom, his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> See, sometimes you got to understand that the source's hands... If you just let God be God, you would know that his hands are bigger than yours. The Bible says in Psalms that God has goodness stored up for those who fear him. Some of y'all have storage spaces. Don't raise your hands. Some of y'all got so much stuff that you got a house. And you need a storage space to throw all your extra stuff in. Look at someone and say, he's talking to you. That's the perfect analogy, though, that God, let me read that verse. God has goodness stored up for those who fear him. The analogy is that God has a whole bunch of stuff, but he has so much goodness that he has to rent a storage space. That if you just turn to him, he has so much goodness planned for you. All you have to do is walk in fear of God. Lord, Lord, you're the reason. You're the re he, you got to tap into God with your time. I don't care what you're facing. God has goodness stored up for you. The last, he, Jesus worked a job. He loved his daddy. And here's the last thing. He loved people and invested his time with people. That's what he did. When Jesus was on the earth, you want to you wanna invest 2019, you need to work your job, love God, and invest your time with people. See, have you ever called somebody on the phone and you know they're in a hurry? Oh, okay. I called Joanna today. She hung up on me. She's laughing, but it's true. You ever visited someone on the street and, and you felt that same hurried feeling? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right, all right, okay, all right, okay, all right. Have you ever been guilty of that? We all have. What if you decided to tie some of your time and save up chunks of your time for people 
like Jesus? Are you willing to allow someone to interrupt your pre-established plans? Most of the time, you're just rushing home to watch the next R. Kelly episode. When a woman's fed up. I got to bring it back. I don't have much time. See, because we, yeah, we laugh about it, but oftentimes the interruptions and why we don't have time for people is because of a television show or social media interaction. You know that some studies show that, that we are living in a time where our single population is the loneliest generation of singles that has ever existed because we've traded real relationships with single serving clicks on our phone and when they look online and see what other people are doing, it looks so amazing all the time. Living my best life, not you. So here's what we do when we go out with people. We take our phone and we set it on the table. Oh, yep, no, I'm here with you. I'm here hanging out. And we take our phone and we put it on the table. I'm totally here with you. Because we do that just to let you know that any piece of random information that happens to come through my phone is way more important than this conversation I'm having with you. Or if you go to a work meeting and you got five minutes before the meeting starts, what does everybody do? Eight people in the, around the table. Mm, whatever. And then, if you really want someone to know you're engaged, you're with them and a phone call comes in. And you're talking, oh, that's amazing. Oh, your, your brother died, that's so crazy. I'm with you, I'm with you. Hold on one second, and the phone rings. Here's what we do. I'm not gonna answer that, because I'm here with you. I'm not gonna answer that. Sad. Why don't we as a church, when we're with people, just keep our phones in our pockets? That would change a lot, would it not? I don't have much time, I can't keep meddling. Look. Put it away. Give someone your full attention. Engage. See, Jesus never pulled out his cell phone. He had time for people in a crowd where he's on his ministry mission. A woman runs up and touches his, his robe, and lots of people were pushing against Jesus, touching him, but he discerned the urgency of a particular touch, and he took time, valuable ministry time, for an interruption. And his disciples are full of fire. Je what? With Jesus, what are you talking about? Someone touched me. The disciples are always pushing Jesus. In Hold on. Let the little children come to me. Get those kids out of here. We don't got time, Jesus. Let them come on to me. Jesus like, no, let them stay. Come on, talk to me. Let's have a, let's have a moment. See, the next time you get interrupted, stop thinking about your deadlines and where you got to go. Think of how do you know that's not a Kairos moment for that person? You are encountering another person that God was willing to die for. Let's make those moments matter. It might turn into a Kairos moment. It might turn into a Kairos moment year. See, Christ, he worked hard. He loved God and spoke to him regularly, and he loved others. We got five minutes left, so why don't we just stand? And why don't you grab the hand of your neighbor? We have antiseptic in the back for when you're leaving. I challenge you today to work hard, love God, and love others. Let's take a moment and pray towards that end. Father, we ask God that 
you would teach us how to number our days and redeem the time that you've given us. We don't have much, but Lord, we want to invest our time in the kingdom. Teach us, God, how to be faithful, even in a job that's obscure. Lord, even if it's something where we don't have the titles or the accolades or whatever. Lord, 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 we ask, God, that you would teach us how to be faithful in our jobs, just like you were for 18 years, God, before you entered into your full-time ministry of saving the world. Teach us, God, how to redeem those jobs. And Lord, first, I, I pray over those jobs. There are some people here that are discontent, God, that are, are praying for an open door. And God, I pray that you would bless them and that you would open doors that no man can shut, God. That they would look back over this year and see the Kairos God moving and engaging in the time that we've been given. And Lord, if somebody, if you're in a good job, Lord, I pray, God, that you would develop consistency. That you would be faithful, that you would be a light in the midst of darkness, God. On, on all of those specific situations. And Lord, that you would also open doors for education, God, and routes where people can advance themselves and, and, and become who they see themselves to be, who they know you've called them to be, God. So Lord, we turn over all of our jobs to you. And Lord, we thank you, God, that you are still our provider. You're still the one who opens every single door for us. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the provision that we have. Our hearts are still filled with gratitude wherever you have us, God. But we want to live in expectation of where you are bringing us. Now, God, just like Christ, I pray that we would have an intimacy with you, Lord. Like for this church, God, that you would, you would draw us to a place of intimacy with you, God. Where every moment, God, the, the little moments of, Lord, we need a parking space. To the big moments of, God, we need breakthrough. Lord, let us turn to you this year. We don't, Lord, we repent even from last year and how we've put you on the back burner, God. But stir our hearts this year, God. This year, God. Let us, let us, even when we leave this place, let us get in our car and thank you, God, for another day. Thank you for the time you've been giving us, God. Lord, teach us as your people how to pray. That's what the disciples ask, God, because we don't understand it at times. Teach us, God, how to pray, how to intercede, how to meet with you and sup with you, God, in 2019. That is how we will fight our battles. So church, develop this prayer life. Intimacy with your Father. And now, God, I pray, God, for our relationships with one another. Lord, teach us, God, how to walk in radical forgiveness. Teach us, God, how to let go of our past. Teach us, God, how to give of ourselves for those around us. And Lord, we ask for Kairos moments in our relationships. Some of us, God, need, need a Kairos moment in our marriage. Some of us, Lord, you're always bringing people into our circle. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, the Kairos moments that we can have in other people's lives. And Lord, we, all, we declare that 2019, God, will be a year of your favor, a Kairos year. Lord, where the quality of our existence is forever changed because we lean into you, our Father. So Lord, we bless you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen, amen. As you're seated, touch someone and say, it's going to be a Kairos year.